Um, but yeah, anything else? Oh, by the way, just for my students with their grades and everything like that, uh, next week I'll be inputting all the grades, so don't worry about that, guys. This is, remember, part of what he's going to say is for your three-paragraph assignment that's due sometime at the end of the week or whatever, and that is your last assignment class, guys. So here we go. Take it away, Sean. All right. Uh, my name is Sean Brown. I worked here at uh, Hoosinger High School. Um, I was a custodian. Now, how I got here, actually, I retired from Northrop Aircraft. I took a job as a sub, and 13 years later, I was still here. Um, it's probably the best job I ever had because I got a lot of love and respect from these young people here. And the beauty of it is I really feel like y'all gonna save my life because uh, I didn't really have a purpose. Uh, when I got back to Vietnam, I, I wondered why I was even alive. Why did, why, did, like, why did God even let me back here? And you were the only ones that wanted to hear my story. My family's never asked me anything. They always played me like something was wrong with me. Uh, I do get a check for PTSD. And if any of y'all have PTSD or any mental disorders, I, I just want to give you a shout out on like, there's nothing wrong with you. We all have different illnesses. So if you feel depressed, anxiety, seek, seek the help. That's where the strong people stand. Now, I went to Marion Lawrence High School. I graduated in 1967 in June. And by December of 67, I was in Vietnam. I arrived right at the top of uh, the Tet Offensive, which happened in 68. Uh, and we end up in Quezon. Now, why did I get in the Marine Corps to begin with? You have to understand, civil rights is connected to Vietnam because it split the country up, just like we're having right now with this pandemic and these riots. People are just hating everybody. So I'm not thinking I'm going to Vietnam. I was thinking I was married, I had a little boy, and I'm thinking, well, I'll get a, I'll get a check, my wife will get a check, my son will get medical, and I'll get life insurance, and I, that's how I'm going to take care of my family. Actually, when I went in, they test you, and I should have been in electronics, but the Marine Corps is basically a combat unit. We are the 411 of the United States of America for the president, or rather 911, excuse me. Now, I picked the Marine Corps because to me, Marine Corps was like AP, like some of you students. It's a bigger challenge, but I figured they said they were the best and we were the best. Um, so I'm proud of y'all for taking a higher risk for a greater gain. A lot of kids would not have the courage to even touch an AP class. So I want you to be proud of that. Um, why we were in Vietnam was supposedly to stop communist aggression coming from North Vietnam down into South Vietnam. Uh, in some ways, that was true, but in other ways, it was not true. You go to war to protect special interest groups. In other words, you go to war basically to protect rich people's money. That's what you're really there for. It's not really about the American flag. It's, it's like that. Now, um, let's go to boot camp first, and they, they're going to guarantee you 13 weeks of hell is what it's going to be like. But you're going to take a certain pride in that when you make it through. That's why they say the, the few to proud, because a lot of guys can't hack it. And since you're training for combat, you're going to be as strong as the weakest person. So they're going to weed you out. If you can't do anything in the Marine Corps that they want you to do, they're pretty much going to send you home before boot camp is even over. Every Marine is a basic rifleman, which means if you cannot qualify with a rifle from 200, 300, 500, and if you're a machine gunner, it's going to be 1,200 yards, they send you home. They have a very serious thing about that rifle. Now, understand, you're in the military, and people that aren't in the military, civilians are even hating on you because they're like, you shouldn't have went to Vietnam. But now you have to remember who went to Vietnam. It's just the guys from the neighborhood. There's no rich kids in Vietnam. It's like some of you young men that go to losing a high school could end up in the next war we have. And there'll be another one, believe me. So anyway, let's, let's finish with that. And uh, the impact was, why don't you talk about like 
how they training when they're in the first all they start a boot camp and they're training the training you're dead. everything you're going to learn as a marine is to kill that's what we do it's just kill 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 and then indoctrinate you in that one of the problems a lot of veterans have they never decompressed us when we came back in other words you could be leaving vietnam today and be back in l.a tomorrow so we didn't get that help. Thank God some of these people, that's going, veterans that are going to Iraq and Afghanistan are getting some kind of help. You kind of decompress. Um, What's your day like, though? You wake up in the morning, well, how do I, mean, I go? They're going to call you out. I was in platoon 1083, and they're going to holler, platoon 1083 on the road, that means come out of your barracks and get information. And the minute they say that at about 4.30 in the morning, all you're going to hear is kill, 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 kill or you're putting your clothes on, everything, until you get outside. And that's, that's, how you're gonna, that's how you're gonna hear for 13 weeks. And they're gonna let you know that's gonna train you for that because if you wasn't really tight and kept your game together, sometimes they just come up and holler in your ear. You're gonna die when you go to Vietnam, boy. But it, the, the weight of it still didn't hit you, it's just words. Cause you're not, you have to understand, you're 18 years old, you're not thinking dying. They don't train us to die, but if you had to, that's what you're supposed to do. I didn't know anybody like that. That's why sometimes it bothers me when they say how brave veterans are. It's not really the bravery. You have no choice. It's either move ahead or you're going to be dead. There is no choice. I mean, you, you might be over in Vietnam and some guys will show up. Yeah, man, I'm here. I'm going to kill everybody in Vietnam. And you're like, get away from me, homie, because you're trying to be a hero or get medals and you get everybody killed. So we don't really relish that. We don't even really like medals. Sometimes they come and give medals to you for bravery, but you know there was always another dude in your unit who might have been braver than you. And he lost his life. So we don't really like the decorations. We don't, it's, a, it's like professional business. We don't do that. I, I saw the president give this one guy a, a, a medal of honor, which is the highest medal you can get. And I could look at that veteran's face and tell his skin was about to crawl off of him. And he's supposed to save like 11 guys in his outfit, but like five more guys died that he couldn't save. So he didn't feel good about that. He was like, why don't you get the medal to the dead man? We're not, we're not here for the glory. You never do that. Now the thing too that made it bad, Americans didn't even know what was going on in Vietnam. This is a very, very beautiful country with some very beautiful people. But at that time, their government in South Vietnam was just as corrupt as the government in North Vietnam. So all the people were doing was suffering. Okay, you're going to a country that you don't speak their language, and believe me, you can't fake Vietnamese. You might be able to fake a little Spanish, you know, burrito, taco, I don't know, you know, a little Spanish if you grew up in LA. But you can't fake Vietnamese. You either know it or you don't. He speaks that, it's his country. You're there for 13 months. So kind of like when I left my wife, I just said, I'll be back in 13 months. When my so-called enemy left, he told his wife, I'll be back when it's over. If it stays for eternity, I would keep fighting this war. So you're in a country you don't know, you don't speak their language, and all these people look alike. And I don't mean that racially, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I couldn't look at a Vietnamese person and tell you whether he was a Viet Cong or an NVA, which is North Vietnamese Army, it's like over in Iraq, in Afghanistan, you can't look at somebody over there and say, oh, I know he's a Taliban. Because the bad guys look like the good guys, good guys look like the bad guys. Now, you're also in a country that has a jungle. Again, Americans, you know, they can't train you for this jungle. What's in this jungle? Tigers, leopards, bears, gorillas, some of the most poisonous snakes, uh, Burmese pythons, cobras. Now, if you're in my company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, like I was in, you would be sleeping on this jungle floor every night. Some nights it looked like the floor, the floor of the jungle's moving. There's centipedes, there's, there's tarantulas, there's all kind of crazy stuff. So you adjust to that. Um, maybe later in life it give you a little break that you feel like if you can go through that, you can go through anything. That's why you students that are not here today and you're doing this from home and with this pandemic and all this crap that's going on in LA right now and across the country actually, this should harden you for combat. So hitting them books shouldn't be no problem. Just go and get with them. So BC versus NBA, let's go for that. For, what's the what's difference between the, the enemies you were fighting first off? And then the okay, the NBA was from North Vietnam. 
they're a regular army, and they're, they're some badasses. They're, they, I got much respect for them. Now, the VC, actually, there was three sets to VC. One was a farmer by day, VC by night. Then another one might be a little VC that work in the villages or work on our bases even. And they just sucking up information. And you don't even know the information they're getting from you. They might say, man, when you guys moving out again, you might say, well, we're going to move out uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 0600. Then he go tell his buddies, they set an ambush up for you. But then you also had the hardcore VC. They stay out there all 24-7 fighting. And they also threatening the, 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 the South Vietnamese people uh, where you, you had to know if they come in your village, they may come in for food, may rest, they may need medical. Mao Zedong said that the people the people were the sea and the VC were like the fish. So without the water, they couldn't exist. So they come in threatening. And one thing I didn't realize until later, we did not endear ourselves to the South Vietnamese people because they would have fire missions with these planes, with the napalm, and they'd take out a whole village. Now we're telling these people, we're here to help you. And they're like, well, help like this. I don't need no enemies. I mean, your help me just blew my whole village up because you thought there was VC or NVA in that village. Now, when you got to Vietnam, you understand your mission as Marines is going to be search and destroy. I love this because I noticed with, with, um, with Iraq and Afghanistan, they took this word destroy out. It was supposed to be searching something, but th this is a negative. So they don't, want, they don't want you to think you're actually searching and destroying people. Okay, this, this is the dumbest way you can fight a war. It's chasing the enemy. The thing about Vietnam, we never knew where they were at. They always knew where we were at. And they're never going to hit you until they got full advantage. In other words, until they get enough of you in a kill zone, that's when they're going to hit. So sometime when you're walking in patrols, they might let you walk right by because you're not a big enough fish yet. Or we ain't got enough in this kill zone. But you have to understand, you're a Marine. When you left boot camp, what did they tell you? Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil because I'm the baddest mother in this valley. You're going to believe all that until you actually are in combat. But we train realistically, but it's not the same. So when you're out here searching, this is how it's going to go down. We're going to go on an ambush, or we're going to go on a patrol, rather. Now, you've never seen nobody shot. You've never seen anything. Most of the time, it's going to be an L-shaped ambush. You're out in the jungle. These are Marines, these little X's here. This here, these are AK-47s set on full auto. They like to fight out of these holes, they call them spider traps. It's like a trapdoor spider. They pop up, bam, they pop back down. Now remember, when you got your little badge for your rifle range at two, three, five, and 1,200 yards, you're feeling like a pride. This war was not fought from those distances. This war was fought from more like five, 10, maybe 15, 20 yards. So this guy here, that's Alexander Chisholm, my homeboy, he got killed. I cried like a baby, I was so angry. It was like he ain't supposed to die. This is the first man I seen in Vietnam get killed. He walks point. The enemy puts a machine gun right here. Now, the way you're supposed to spring this for full effect, you take out the last man and the first man. That leaves everybody else kind of bunched up. Now, we're not Arnold Schwarzenegger, nobody like that. So if you stand your ground and try to fire back, within three to five seconds, you will be a dead man. Because as this patrol is moving down, when that man that shot Chisholm popped up, he was probably maybe less than five yards away from Chisholm and put a burst of AK right through his chest. Now, what you actually do is that you retreat. Now, this distance of retreating is, we just want to move back, we're not catching any more enemy fire. This is a Claymore, that's another game they like to play open up on these dudes and have a claymore go across here. So what happens is you're not really afraid. The adrenaline is pumping so hard, you don't have no time to be scared. 
So the next thing, all y'all out there that want to be machine gunners, it's the most deadly job on the battlefield. They want to kill you first. Because every fifth round on that belt, that's what I used to carry, the M60 machine gun. That's it there. But you see this belt of ammunition? Every fifth round is a tracer, so it lights up red. And it's shooting so fast, it almost looked like a red ribbon. So the enemy knows, shoot where you see the red. Because none of you, we call you grunts. You got maybe AR-15s, M60, whatever. You're not moving anywhere unless I put down suppressing fire. That means I gotta keep the enemy's head down while you move ahead. This has been an any war. Any war. All right, now. So now you got comes up. Now after you get back here, you're, you're ascertaining your situation. The scariest thing to me, believe it or not, 90% of the time, you never knew where the fire was coming from. Never. You always had a moment where you had to figure out which where they at. Because in this jungle, it's so thick, you don't really see a full body mass. Sometimes you just see part of an arm as they're running through the elephant grass or a leg or something. You just have to shoot over there. You don't really see a body very often. Sometimes, but not very often. All right, now, the next order is going to be guns up. That means my gunners, there's two to each squad. We're going to get online, and then the rest of you grunts are going to get online. You got M79 grenade launchers. You got... BARs, you got all your weapons, and we decide that we know it's coming from here. So what we do, we assault. We do just like that movie Predator. You actually get on the assault line and shoot everything in front of you. Now, you're still not afraid, but all of a sudden you notice there's Marines around you dropping like flies. And I have to tell you, young men, this, if you ever have sons and they have to go to war, you be the guy daddy paying for the soccer and the football and the baseball and all that other crap. He ain't going to holler your name. i never seen a man yet shot that didn't holler a mama. It's usually followed by God or his wife's name. That's what's going to happen. You never holler daddy. And like I said, you have so much adrenaline and you cannot stop to pick up the wounded because if you stop for even a second to try to help somebody, you're probably going to get killed. And these are guys, some of them you've been knowing for maybe four or five months. I mean, you, you, your whole life is around them. Shut what up. To you? But let's we'll say you take this position. But up here, you're going to have bodies. And they're going to be screaming. They're going to be doing all kinds of stuff. So that's when you decide who goes in the body bags and who gets a medevac out of there. And then this is when you know what war is really about. Because you're going to walk patrols every day that you're in Vietnam. Every day you're going to be on patrol. They say it's just that that next patrol you are on, you can hear that AK-47 off in your head for at least two days. And you can hear them screams and you can smell that blood for at least two days. They don't train you for that, believe me. All the training in the world don't get you on that. You'll never make it in the movie. Now, what the enemy would like to do, we take this position, he just moved back, set it up over here, and then I just sound for another point man to come up, and the point man comes up and we do it all over again, and again, and again, and again. Now, after a while, this hunting the enemy gets very old, and it's not that you become a coward, you're not a coward, you see we're not making any headway here. There was something the government used to do that I hated, was our body counts. They might report to the papers that we we took Hill 512, we killed 300 NVA. I've never seen 300 NVA. Maybe we killed 50. But this war is a money game. So I want to inflate these numbers so Congress will support and allocate more money, more troops, and we're really not winning it. Because it, it comes down to where you shoot two of them today, they shoot two of us tomorrow, and then two more, and blah, blah, blah. But you can see there's never going to be no ending to it. One more death is not going in this war. A man named Burns did a documentary that made me so angry. Ken Burns, if you ever see any of his documentaries, he's like the greatest documentary guy in the world. They knew in 1965 we would not win this war with the strategy we had. 
they stayed there into the 70s because America had never lost a war. And they was kind of embarrassed about that. That's why Tricky Dick Nixon came up with peace with honor. There ain't no peace with honor, man. But one thing they did learn out of Vietnam is do not show body bags being taken off of C-140s and, and caskets. That's why you don't see that no more. With Iraq and Afghanistan, you don't see that. Bad for business. Straight up, it's bad for business. That's how they look. Because you can't tell me I'm winning the war and you bring all these 18, 19, 20-year-old young men on dead. You couldn't possibly be winning. Um... I want to talk about terms of service cherries and officers, like 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 some of the people you're yeah, fighting with. Some of the hardships were just. I'll give you an example. You're going to be on in the bush every day. You're there. At least my outfield was. Every night you you're going to. I mean the mosquitoes and every morning the leeches are going to be all over your body. And then sometimes it's actually cold, but the cold you're talking maybe 70 degrees. And you feel like you're in Alaska only because that day it was 115, 118 degrees and then it drops to 70 and you're about to freeze to death. The hardships, the, the, the monsoons, the uncertainty, and there's a rumor every day, the war's gonna end today, the war's gonna end today. The war, it never did. Not for us, it never did. And sometimes you would get what we call like cherry officers or cherry Marines. They are straight out of um, what, what, they're straight out of training. So they actually think they're going to come over and kill every VC, every NBA they see, and we're going to win this war. You're always leery about them because, like, dude, you just got here. I've been here nine months. They ain't how the game you play. I don't know if they told you, you can actually die here. You understand? So they were kind of like dangerous. We used to call them John Waynes. And then you had some of these officers straight out of I, officer training school that are coming over telling you what to do and they haven't even been in combat. The last lieutenant I had was my favorite lieutenant. We used to call him Little John because I'd had so many lieutenants come out there and ask me stupid stuff. So when he showed up, he come out to my gun position and I told him, I said, let me tell you right now, I ain't carrying no spare barrel. I ain't carrying that damn tripod. That's taking too much weight and I ain't worried about it. And it was kind of weird because he goes like, oh, okay, 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 okay. No, we're gonna see how y'all do. So he saw us in combat he fell in love with us. That was our lieutenant. The day I got medevaced, that man had six inches of blown, uh, bone blown out of his lower left leg. He tells me, Wiley, drag as many bodies off that hill as you can to where we can get to a, an LZ, which is a landing zone, so the choppers can come get our wounded and dead, and you leave me up in this hill with three clips for my M16. I said, there ain't no way. And he was mad as hell at me, but I'm like, you understand, the man is telling me, I will keep them off of you and I will die. That's what a death before dishonor comes in. People wouldn't understand that. But it is, because you cannot, you couldn't skate. Just like y'all face this AP stuff and you're going to face it next year and all the crap is going on. You ain't got no choice, man. What you going to do? You going to quit or you going to stand up and take it? As bad as things are now, for you young people, this is going to make you stronger, I guarantee you. But just don't make the same mistakes all these old businessmen and crap do. Um, war is basically extreme boredom to extreme terror. Now everybody can see that, I'm sure, is a box of frosted flakes. When we were pulling out a case sign, they had like a mess hall, which is like a cafeteria. He's throwing all kind of trash out. So I found a box of them. My boy Nick Babbage found some evaporated milk. It's powdered milk. Really kind of gross. But you mix it with water. But when you've been eating sea rice for about nine, ten months in a row, and this is symbolic for me because it reminds me of coming back to the world. We never say go back to the United States. We always say, I just want to go back to the world. Because things here made sense. Things over there did it. So we hook up. It's like a breakfast, and we're sitting there eating it. I remember I told Nick, I said, man, if we had some bananas, you wouldn't be able to tell me nothing. If I had some bananas, it'd be like a bomb. This is better than sex, money, whatever, drugs. Ain't nothing better than these cornflakes tasting right now. And just like that, you got blew up. Well, all this red dust come up, you can't hardly see, but you hear people screaming. 
but I didn't know what kind. I knew it was incoming, but I didn't know if it was a missile, a, a mortar, or an artillery shell. I didn't know. So as this, this, this dirt kind of like dissipates, um, I see him. And I'm saying, Nick, get down, get down. So when I pulled him around, his head was just gone. I mean, half of it was just missing. Now, I don't tell you that for the blood and guts. What I'm saying, I was so angry because I'm like, we're, we're hardcore Marines eating some, eating some cornflakes. And within 10, 15 seconds, my homeboy gone. That's what makes you want to go out and kill them. You know what I mean? You got mad. Like, where they at? Because I killed every one of these bastards. I swear to God. The same way I felt when Chisholm got killed. But believe it or not, you have to maintain your self-discipline. And like, I'm sorry he got killed, but we might be getting overrun. So I ain't got time to mourn him right now. That's how the game get played. You know, you know the switches go boom. For me, cornflakes is death. Eating cornflakes is death. That's how the game got played. And people back in this country didn't even know what he was going through. We would read stuff out of an uh, armed forces um, magazine or newspaper. I forgot exactly what it was called. But you're in Vietnam, and they're killing Martin Luther King. They're killing Bobby Kennedy. I'm trying to think it was one more. But I'm just saying, we're looking back at our country like, what the hell are they doing? These were men of peace and stuff. Um, Oh, and Malcolm X, and people like that. I mean, you're, you're, see, that's one thing that's a problem right now, children. We don't have any leadership, but you might be the leaders. You might be the leader. But we really don't have leadership out there right now. It's kind of helter skelter. And I feel like everybody's in it for their own game. See, I have to remember, I always said that y'all generation was kind of like the me generation, me, 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 me. And my generation, we started the civil rights movement, and we were the we, we, we generation. So you got to decide how you're going to work that. Um, the wallet. I tell the wallet story because when you get to boot camp, there's 70 of you in a platoon. Every Marine got a wallet with pictures, 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 pictures. That's my wife. That's my grandma. That's my mother. That's my brother. Whatever, my kids. And see, the problem is when they get killed, you feel a, a certain survivor guilt because you know so much about their family. Their family might not even know you, but you know them. So you kind of like, damn, I wish I wouldn't have known this dude, man. But what happens is there was an enemy soldier that I took out. And anytime we made a kill, you always search for, like, you know, maps even letters, anything to give us a heads up. What, what unit is he from? Where are they planning on going? So you find these things out. I opened that wallet up, he had a wallet on him, and I swear to God, it was two pictures of like little children. And I, I kind of like knew they must be his kids. And he was an NBA soldier. And a picture of his wife. Now, they didn't, they didn't give me the PTSDs and none of that. I just felt like all of a sudden it hit me that he's not really my enemy. He's really just like me. See, if we're gonna look at these other human beings, oh, we'd be great. Forget colors and all that, and religions and genders, they don't mean nothing. But I understood why he wanted to kill me. And not because I was from America and he might have been a communist or whatever. He wanted to go back to them kids. And just like my wallet, they had my wife and my son's picture. And if you get in my way, I'm gonna kill you because I'm trying to go home. The hospital stay. How about we talk about your million dollar move? So what happened to you? How oh. did you get out? Because you served for how long? You served 13 months and, and what happened to you? To Actually, um, the day the day I got medevaced out of there, it was on artillery. It was supposed to land here, if you all if y'all can see this red line. Instead, it landed here, which made it about 50 yards short. And it landed right on what was left. Because when we went on that hill that morning, we went up with 65 Marines, and we only walked off with 15 of us, and we all were wounded, and the rest of them were dead. And they called in this artillery because the enemy kept chasing us back down this hill as we're trying to retreat. Because we were trying to get back far enough to bring choppers in to get the dead and the wounded out. So what happened was that uh, I remember this lieutenant, he was kind of gung-ho, he called in a fire mission. A fire mission is three rounds for effect. That means artillery rounds or bombs or whatever. They called it in, 
And we, what you have in your, there's a guy in your platoon called a forward observer. We call them FOs. They're the guys with the compasses and the maps, and they can bring in artillery or naval gunfire, whatever you want. He knows how to put the coordinates in there and get it on target. Well, normally they shoot three just to make sure you're on target. And I remember this forward observer because this is about, oh, hell, man, it's about 11, 12 o'clock at night. You couldn't even see in the jungle. And I remember the forward observer said, I don't want to call it in, sir. I don't know where we're even at. And they called it in, and it fell on my platoon. The only thing that saved me was it hit here, but there was like a, a hill. So it kind of went into the side of the hill, which threw most of the shrapnel that way. If it had we'd have been on flat ground. When it blows up, it's a 360-degree deal, and you probably, we'd all probably been dead. But um, I remember them calling that in, and this ain't not hope. This ain't no joke. Man, I got shot through the helmet that day. I had an 81 millimeter, 82 millimeter mortar land next to me, didn't go off. My homeboy said some dude shot me in the back. I don't know what he was talking about. I didn't get shot in the back. And um, I remember my friend Daryl Ponce from Kansas City, Missouri said, hey man, how you doing? I said, I don't know, man, I must be God. They can't kill me. And the second that came out of my mouth, that thing sounded like a train coming over you. Boom, blew up and hit me. And my flat jacket was kind of on fire, and I couldn't move my arm, so I was kind of like, damn, man, it blew my arm off. I mean, you know, what the hell? But as things worked out, I was cool. The hole was big. Luckily, it was so hot when it hit me, it cauterized the artery in here. It would save my life. Because the only thing I could think of I was sitting down was a turn to the left. Because I was kind of like, I give up a little booty, but I don't want to get no head shot. You know, with a head shot, you'd be gone. But to show you, sometimes I've had people come to me like, we well, do you believe in God? And I man, don't talk to me about all that, man. When I turned, if I would have been like a millionth of a second slower, it wouldn't have caught my shoulder. It would have caught me probably in the jugular vein, and I'd have been dead. So after that went down, what we did, Ponce was hitting his left leg. So we took his belt off, wrapped it around my right leg, wrapped it on his leg. I picked up my 60. And Corporal Lautner's leg, because that's all we found to him was part of his leg, and we started marching out of there. And I remember this lieutenant come talking about, you can't leave here, Marine. I said, watch this. Watch this. He's not going to get us killed. But his whole game was to make more rank. I think the saddest thing I've seen in Vietnam is coming up to this hill, and my captain, he's a Marine Corps captain, y'all. You got to remember, this is a Marine Corps captain. Cried like a baby. He said, look what they did to my Marines. And I said, see ya. And I won't be back again. You can believe that. You don't have to worry about me. I'm going home. The reason I put this hospital stay, because I didn't know how serious this shoulder wound was. And they want me to do some kind of physical therapy. And I was like, ah, no physical therapy. You're not going to make me better and send me back to that war. And he said, well, you know, like if you don't, you might lose your arms. Too. I said, well, whatever. A guy one morning, right before served breakfast, a guy with no legs, blown off, clear up to here in a wheelchair, rolled over to my bed and handed me my breakfast tray and said, hey, Marine, here's your breakfast. That's when I had to give it up because <laughs> I could not have a man with no legs feed me. I said, well, okay, I'll take the whatever. And if you send me back to Vietnam, you're just going to send me back. But I couldn't have a man that had, he was so, he was so glad to be alive. And I wasn't feeling that. I was like, I'm done. I don't care what you call me. So, Sometimes you're going to meet people that would inspire you, <laughs> and you're going to look at them like, why are you so happy? You ain't had no legs. But I guess in my mind, say, no, I ain't got no legs, but I don't have to buy shoes either. <laughs> you know, so the hell with y'all. <laughs> you know, I'm cool with that. Um, the thing about El Rey Tacos, when I went to Maine, that was like our hangout. All the kids went there after school and after parties and everything. And I remember being down there. And this guy I didn't even know just came up and sucker punched me. And I, I lost it. I was only home about four or five days in Vietnam, so I just lost it. And in my mind, I must kill him. That's why I was telling y'all earlier about that decompression thing. I'm like, oh, he got to die. And I just kept beating him and beating him. Finally, somebody said the police coming. So the two girls I would put me in the car, they took me back to my daddy's house. So when I walk in, I tell him, I said, I need that 357, man. So he looking at the girls like, what's wrong with him? 
Somebody beat him up and said, no, that boy don't even fight. He's laying down there. He's got blood coming out of his head. And Sean will stop kicking him and pounding him with trash can. So my old man said, what do you want the 357 for? I said, because he got to die, daddy. You don't understand, man. He got to die. I just got back from Vietnam. You think I'm having a civilian jacking me? I ain't even arguing with you, boy. I don't even know why he sucker punched me. So what happened was daddy pulls me down. He sits on my chest. And the two girls, these are my best two female friends, Pulled my pants down, my drawers, everything. When they finished, I was butt naked. <laughs> and then my daddy said, now if you want to go down there, take your buttons on down there and handle your business. <laughs> Even to this day, my friends, sometimes I see them, and we know you'd be talking and teasing and stuff. Like that. You remember what happened in 68 and in 68? We'll take them pants off you again, <laughs> you know. But they said, I joke about it, but to tell you the truth, if my father would have gave me that gun, I'd have went down and killed that boy. I was that angry. I couldn't believe that it was even happening. You know, like, no, no way. Now, for my young people, I, I have to put this up here, and I hope you're not taking this racially. Um, I'm not meaning race. My son has done 26 years in the penitentiary. So, girls, please, my, 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 my daughters, y'all, my daughters, my children, this is not your future. Boys, these are not your future. But we're going to try to pray for these because we know there's a dysfunction here. I'm not hating on anything. Like these brothers got a little AK, pants hanging on. They're doing AK on maybe whatever, Facebook. When they catch their case, this picture's going to be in court. Trust me, it's going to be in court. So we just try to pray for them, but we know there's a dysfunction. Maybe they didn't get enough love. I don't know. But I'm not going to hate. But at the same time, we need to fix these problems. See, this my, when I put my turf, but I rent, you know, there's people controlling your neighborhood, so you ain't allowed to go a certain place because they say so, but everybody in the neighborhood paying rent. Don't buy own no property here. Sometimes my kids can't go to certain neighborhoods. They can't wear certain colors. They can't do this. I know my son was a straight-ass script. I already know. I know how the game get played. I don't think it's fair that they get to tell you what you can do or where you can go or whatever, and they don't pay nothing. Like I say, hey, these kids, you my Marines. You perform through adversity. Then what you're gonna to need to get through this life. Self-discipline, self-esteem, and self-confidence. And self-love too. Don't forget that. You need to love yourself. Because if you love yourself, the world gonna look beautiful to you. If you don't love yourself, you're gonna find out the ugly. As simple as that. But that self-discipline and that self-esteem, it's like bravery. In other words, it makes you do when you have to do and not when you want to do. Y'all AP, y'all know that. Black lives, they matter. There's no doubt about that. But let me tell y'all where this really comes from. This comes from 400 years. This is nothing new. When they freed the slaves, maybe some of y'all are not aware of this. When they freed them, they did not give them citizenship. That came later. And ever since then, we've all thought, like, first of all, you shouldn't even brought us here to begin with, and you wouldn't even have this problem. But since you did not take us out of Africa, you know, they call us Afro, Afro-Americans, but it's not that I don't like that term, but I kind of feel like, can I be an American? Because under the skin, we're all Americans, and everybody's contributed to make this a great country. And you cannot hate your white brothers because they're not all racist. It's going to take everybody to put this country right. The whites, the blacks, the browns, the yellows, the red. America got a hell of a debt to pay. But you gotta remember, I had a history teacher, Mr. Okui, he was my homeroom teacher in eighth grade, and he said, one of the things wrong in America is there's a bunch of old ass rich white men running this, and they're not even in touch with nothing that's going on in the community. That's why some of these people on the, on the Supreme Court, they ought to be gone, man. They, they, they almost got amnesia or what, somehow they, uh, bad ass, they don't even know. But you be the leaders, and then you can change it. But to me, all lives matter. I can't remember this quote word for word or who wrote it, but I do remember this one line in that quote. Any man's death diminishes me. Check it out. Now, uh, line, I'm living through this history. I've been in every riot there been, but I've never participated in looting and all this kind of stuff. It's so ignorant. We do have a First Amendment. Let's deal with that. Because all you're doing is the people that hate your culture or your, or your race is going to even hate you more. Because man said on the news this morning, he said, you really messed up the people in the Midwest. Because a lot of, I wouldn't say the negative about Midwesterners, they, they're good people, but there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of stuff going on in the Midwest, okay? 
So if they hating on you because you're black or Hispanic, are you a woman, are you gay, are you Jewish, or whatever, this is going to make them even hate you more. They're not going to see your side of that. That's why your education will free you. Knowledge is strength. Never forget that. It's the only thing they can't take away from you. The only thing. Everything else can be taken, but not your knowledge. That's why I look at my teachers as Marines, because they don't believe in leaving no dead behind either. So I always respect them. Don't come in talking smack. Tired of y'all talking smack when you don't know nothing. Get an education so you get a career, something you love to do. And then try to pull another brother up, which is try to, instead of taking him down. If y'all got some questions, let's blow this thing on up. I'd like to hear some. You're my kids, I love you. Morning. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm on there. Okay, yeah, so guys, anyone has any other questions for Sean, guys? Throw them up here on the chat right now, guys. Let's see. I mean, Sean keeps it pretty real for you guys. It's unfortunate you guys weren't in the classroom with us, right? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of energy when when yeah. you the kids, you guys are all here and stuff like that, all right? Um, but any questions you might have, guys, throw it out there. Mr. Carr will read it for uh, Sean. Got anything? Oh, uh, from Laylee. Uh, what was the most important thing you learned from your service? This is from Laylee. Um, the most important thing I think I learned was really just fighting that ad adversity. I mean, it just you got to keep trucking. You can't quit. You have no choice. And the more of this adversity that you conquer, the more confidence that you have in yourself to be able to handle. And that way you always keep a cool head and you enjoy your life. Because if you come through war, you pretty much come through about anything. I mean, right now, when I got back to Vietnam, I had tuberculosis. Uh, no, I had malaria first, then tuberculosis. I've had cancer. They told me I only had a year to live. That's been six years ago. I'm still here. I've been shot up in the war. I'm still here. So there's got to be some purpose why I'm here. So um, just even on their darkest days, know that the light is there. I'm telling you. But you have to keep grinding to get to that light. Just keep going. Keep going. You'll get there. Because what you want out of your life is a quality life and not a quantity life. That's what's wrong with a lot of people now. They seek in quantity, but they don't have no quality in their life. I learned this from Vietnam. I was on self-destruction when I came back to Vietnam. I made big money in the aircraft, had nice cars, all the girls, I had all the dope, the liquor, I had all that. And then all of a sudden it just hit me. I don't have no quality in my life. So the quantity didn't take away my pain because I couldn't figure out why I was here. My country hated me. My family even hated me. My grandmother told me I wasn't nothing but a paid killer. So just hang in there. Days will get better, I, I promise you. But you got to put yourself in a position to get your blessing. So never quit, please. Okay, um, Gerald says, thank you for your service. Uh, Princess, she says, she asks, how did you deal with PTSD that you had after the war? Well, first of all, I had to recognize it, tell you that, because I didn't, I didn't even know. I kind of knew something wasn't right, but I wasn't sure what it was. Because actually, when I came back to Vietnam, I was kind of like, if you ain't trying to kill me, I mean, don't give a damn. And that's how I got on that self-destruction trail. Because I didn't care about nothing else. If you ain't trying to shoot me, I didn't care. But the easiest way for me to deal with it is to recognize it. And recognize it's not something to be ashamed of. And it's really not just a military thing. People keep thinking that. But you would, you would have friends that may be in a car wreck or something. And maybe you're supposed to go to a party with them or something, but you didn't go. Because maybe your mama said, no, I got a feeling. I don't want you going. You know, I said, you feel guilty. Because you actually feel like you could have done something, but you couldn't do nothing. But you think you could. But embrace it. Gain the knowledge. Even my psych, I was, I'll, be, I'll be seeing my psych next month. There is no cure, but she gives me tools on how to handle my PTSD, my depression, my anxiety. She gives me the tools. And that's all you. If you got the right tool, ain't no job impossible. So that's that's how you handle it. You face it, and that's what you do. Okay. Uh, Thomas asks, how did you feel about entering the villages and seeing all of them destroyed? 
Uh, when I went there, I thought we were really going on, on, on a mission of honor to help these people. And in some ways, I think we did them more harm. I really do. I really think we did them more harm. Because we didn't connect with them. We supposed to be their friends, but we... You have to remember, 60,000 Americans killed, 600,000 wounded. And the thing that always bothers me, they don't even know how many Vietnamese women and children, it could be a million, could be a million and a half, could be two million died from B-52s to, to F-4 Phantoms, napalming, who knows? And I feel like we didn't... You didn't give us a chance to do the job, and that was kind of embarrassing. Okay. Uh, Giselle asked, what mindset did society have during the time you enlisted? Wait a second. Uh, what mindset did society have uh, during the time you enlisted? Well, my father told me I was the dumbest Negro in America to go fight a white man's war. And a lot of people believe that. But I wasn't political then. I wasn't even thinking about it. Like I say, I'm just thinking about how I can take care of my family. But uh, society looked down on us, man. I mean, they, they, they always talk about Vietnam veterans like we're all nuts. But I put you in the same situation I was, and you're not going to come back nuts, but you're not going to come back the same kid you was when you was 18 and graduated from high school. I guarantee you that. But they make it sound like, oh, they come back different. Oh, yeah, you think so? <laughs> Try that. Try having one of your homeboys take a bullet through the head and blow half of it on, on, your, on the side of your neck or something. You're going to come back different. But it don't mean you're crazy. This means you know the truth, that your government will put you somewhere and get you killed so they can make more money. Okay, Leia asks, how did, the, how did life change for you after the war? I always compare that to some of my children in school. <laughs> you grow up mighty fast, but it's not the way you're supposed to grow up. Some of y'all gotta take care of brothers and sisters that are like two years old and you in high school. You're supposed to be able to enjoy this. And sometimes that war just like flip a switch on you, man. You're like, whoo, I should grow up fast on that one. Cause when my, my, some of my friends that didn't go, they back here, they still, they might have a little job, they got girlfriends, they working, you know, whatever. Maybe, you know, they doing a little going to the parties, going to the beach, having a good time, being a kid. That's what a kid's supposed to do. A kid ain't supposed to be in no blood and gut bath, but some of us are. Hope they helped you. That's all I can say. Hope they helped you. Okay. Uh, Nancy asked, how did your attitude towards the war change from the beginning of the war to the end? Uh, that's an excellent question. And the reason why it changed, because I saw we were not winning. I mean, I'm not the bravest man in the world, but see what happens. You get to a certain mindset. You're more afraid of being a coward than being killed. That's how Marines are made. So after a while, it was just like, I'm not, I, I put it like this, if I could have died there and I would have ended the war, then so be it. But you knew it wasn't gonna happen like that. Cause like I say, our strategy totally sucked. So we just nitpicking and you can see this war isn't going anywhere. It's just not going anywhere. So there, there's never gonna be a winner in this type of war. Or actually to be where would you, no one has ever won a war. I mean, World War II, they say, well, we won. No, we really didn't win. We lost a lot of dues and, you know, nobody ever wins. It's, it's the dumbest thing a man can do. Because if I talk to you, we can come up with something, but I take your life, there ain't no more talking. And you gotta remember, you can kill men, but you cannot kill their ideas. There's always gonna be communists, there's always gonna be racists, there's always gonna be whatever, whatever, whatever. So it's, it, we need to have dialogue not guns, that's why I see it. Okay, um, Messiah asks, when you came back from the war, how was your family affected? I think they kind of tried to overlook it. They never asked me anything. My family don't even know I was a machine gunner. They never asked me anything about the war, but they always kind of like, I always felt like they were looking at me with one eye kind of open and one eye closed, like, I don't know, he seemed different, but different like in a bad way or something. And I was like, well, you haven't even asked me what I've done. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty highly decorated. You don't ask me about my medal. You don't ask me about nothing. You just assume there's something wrong with me. But to tell you the truth, I think I had the PTSD from my childhood all the way to Vietnam. Because I grew up in a broken home while my mom and daddy do was fight, drink, 
and cuss each other out. And we were always, the kids were always like in the middle of it. You know, I got to pick my mother over my father, my father over my mother. So I think it almost set me up for my destiny was to go to Vietnam one day. I really believe that. Because again, PTSD is not just a military thing. I know there's children probably have it when they come through a lot of abuse and different things, and we were abused kids. So I think I had, I mean, I, I was, the Marine Corps probably saw me coming. <laughs> like, come on, boy. <laughs> we already know you got problems. He's just the kind of guy we like. Okay. Uh, Alyssa asks, uh, do you think there is a lack of support and tools for veterans after the war? Oh, yeah. There was no doubt about that. No doubt. They're doing much better now at the VA. But see, what the veterans got to understand, the VA is not there to get you money. They're trying to get you killed. You got you to apply for that. So if you're working for the VA as a doctor, like when I got my money, I finally got my 100%. They send you to an outside doctor. But they're starting to recognize, even my cancer, it could be Agent Orange. Because they denied Agent Orange so long. But I had bladder cancer. And I remember when I was at Long Beach, this one nurse, she real cool with me. She come in and said, you know, it's a funny thing about you Vietnam veterans. All y'all seem to keep getting the same cancer. Now they finally said, well, yeah, it could be that. See, I'm already getting 100%. I don't need any more money. They're not going to give me any more money. I don't want the money. I just want to get it documented that this Agent Orange, which was an anti-defoliant that they sprayed on us all, all over Vietnam, that I'm another one who had bladder cancer. Because a lot of them have kidney, bladder, all kind of cancers. But they all relate back to this Agent Orange. And they've been in denial about this ever since the 19... Well, really, whoever came back before me, it could be 1965. So, yeah, I, um, I think they're doing better. I really do. I think they're doing better. Um, let's see. Uh, Messiah asks, were you nervous to come back home? You know, I wasn't really nervous, uh, but it's after I got back here and saw it was way different. And the thing about the history, was I different or was my society different? You know, I think, I think a little of both. I think a little of both. Because we weren't welcome back. We weren't like heroes. We didn't get a ticker tape parade. And I say even your family, I remember my ex-wife saying this, because my daughter is the one that took me to the VA like 30 some years later when I filed for my comp pension. And, <laughs> excuse me, I remember she looked at my daughter, no, she looked at me and said, damn, you ain't over that shit yet? And I was like, I don't know, you overshooting your daddy yet? I don't know what to tell you. But even all them, like 30 years later, she still ain't understood what I went through. You know, that was her remark, like, wow, you ain't over that shit later? I'm like, what do you mean by over it later? Of course not. It's, you're never going to be over it. You just have to have the tools to be able to deal with it. I can almost tell you when I'm going to have an anxiety attack. I can just feel it. I know what's around me. And the funny thing about you children, you're the only ones I can really be around on a regular basis. I don't like a lot of adults around me because too much stuff be happening. I don't, you won't see me in no club. I'm 70 years old. What I look like going in the club? Let's get in the wheelchair contest. <laughs> you know what we're going to do with that. I can't do that. But thank you for your question. I love you. Thank you so much. Let's see. Uh, Grace asks, what is your view on the, uh, on the movement occurring at the... Uh, that's happening right now. Uh, what do you think needs to happen to better this nation and its meaning of catering justice? Okay, number one, America got to put their arms around everybody. Now, black folks might be leading right now because that's how civil rights started. But if you watch them, the, the, these, these films and stuff, you see every race is in civil rights. So we need to embrace everyone because everyone has contributed. Everyone. They use black people in slavery. Well, if you look at the way they did with, with the Aztecs and the Indians, that was slavery too. Okay, the yellow man, he built a railroad, and that was big time, trust me, because that thing hooked from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And that, I mean, where before you might order something, say you're in California, you order something from like St. Louis, it might be nine months before you get out there. I mean, this is big time technology. Bam, they did that. Uh, White people have don't donated into making this country. In other words, we're all here to make it great, man. But the thing is, you won't see that in history books 
say maybe in high school of really saying who all contributed. We all helped build this country. That's why when a certain man said, make America great again, I was confused. Cause like, well, it ain't been great for poor people and poor people come in every color, trust me. Every white man ain't a millionaire. Every Jew ain't a millionaire, I guarantee that. So it's like, what is he talking about? Make America great again, damn. I don't even know when, when that was. But I think we all need to come together because your struggle becomes my struggle. See, if they're doing you wrong, they're going to be doing me wrong next. I'll be in the barrel next. So if we could just look at that and say we're just human beings. We all need our jobs. We all need our family. We all need, um, um, we all need love. We gotta stop the hate and give more love. Cause love don't cost nothing. Hate costs stuff. You gotta, you gotta keep that in your head. It's like carrying bricks on your back. Let it go. Okay. So I would say, yeah, let's work on some love, really. Cause love is, uh, who? <laughs> Seems like it went away or something, man. Uh, Laylee asked, what was the most surprising thing about joining the army? Or what was something you didn't expect when you were joining the army? What was the... I wasn't in the army, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I'm sorry. That's all good. I mean, yeah. you know, don't pay no attention, Mr. Brown. You know, I can't climb with you a little bit. I probably don't like you, you know. Um, well, actually, the, the most surprising thing is, because you have to understand, when you get out of high school, if you go in really any military, you go in the Marine Corps, this is going to be the greatest thing you ever did in your life up to that point because they test you in ways, I mean, the first couple of days, they're gonna tell you, in 13 weeks, this is where you're gonna be. This is how the kind of guy you're gonna be. This is what you can do. And to tell you the truth, you're looking at him like, is this man insane? <laughs> like, that is not gonna happen. But if you buy in, in them 13 weeks, you'd be surprised yourself. Like, damn, man, I, I didn't know I had that in me. But they try to most, mostly delete all the civilian out of you and put the military in you because we want military people. We don't want civilians who just go around making excuses and blaming each other. It don't work in the military. So I, that, I took a lot of pride in that, you know? I took a lot of pride in that. My problem with the Marine Corps didn't happen until after I got back from Vietnam. I knew I had problems <coughs> and they didn't have my back because they don't care about that kind of stuff. So I was a little disappointed in them at that time. Like, wow, man, I got a problem, man. My wife wouldn't leave me. Uh, she got my son, can I go home for 30 days? Nope. Get your gear on, we're gonna go out and play war games on the campaign. I'm like, no, we ain't. We ain't doing that. You might be doing it, but I'm not. I see. You. When I got my bag, took off for about six months. I ain't gonna lie. Till I felt betrayed. I thought these people would be knowing what I'm going through, but they, they don't have that type of mentality. They don't care about all that. Your family's last. This country, it's like it's like the military, your country, God, and then your family. It's not, it's not the other way. So you have to watch out for that. Uh, Khadija asks, um, how do you deal with your anxiety in public? Um, they used to give me medication. And then all of a sudden I just figured it out. It's not like I'm negative, but say if I'm gonna go to the market. I already know some clown in front of me gonna keep trying to run that debit card and EBT through there like 10 times and they ain't got no money on it. I chill. I know there's gonna be somebody in line in front of me on a cell phone. Got a bag this big and she looking for eight pennies in there because she don't want to break a dollar. I don't let bother me no more. I know when I give a car a certain amount of room in front of me in the car over here, I can almost sense, watch this, dude, pull over in front of me. Now, what I'm saying, I think that would really tick anybody off, but I've learned, like, don't, 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 uh, don't go out like you're being defeated, but just like, hey man, this is people like that in the world, and don't let them shake up your, your, your boat. Because if you did that, you'd be shook up all day long, every day. So I learned how to handle that anxiety. The thing, that, I'm gonna tell you what the difference between depression and anxiety is. Depression don't bother me as much because I can always see a better day. Anxiety is like taking some LSD. It have you jacked up and you ain't even gotten a fight yet. I mean, like say tomorrow you gotta go to IRS, or you gotta go out of your GMV. 
Oh, God, oh, God, oh, no, you can't sleep, you can't eat. Uh, and then after you go out there, it was never as bad as you what you thought it was going to be. But the anxiety is already taking a toll on your body, you know, and your brain and stuff. You already got yourself all huffy puffy. When I did, man, that was smooth. Then you feel like an idiot. Like, why did I let that get to me? But it's it's a it's a it's kind of a slippery slope. Slow. Some days I do it better than others. Some days I don't. Even coming here today, I didn't have anxiety, but I was telling. I mentioned this. I said I'm more nervous doing this than when I got 35 of y'all in the room. It's kind of a trip, you know, because nobody's even here but me and a couple of teachers. And I'm like, whoo, <laughs> I'm gonna break a commercial, commercial, you know. <laughs> it's like weird. It's weird. Okay. Uh, Nancy asks, what is something you want us to take from your presentation and experience? This is from Nancy. What I would take from my experience, like I said earlier, I just want y'all to love yourself and, and know that everybody's not putting you down and know that you're going to make mistakes because it takes courage to, 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 it's almost like you have to risk failure to gain, to gain some type of greatness and just stay, just keep that in your mind and don't worry about what everybody else got. Uh, I would say don't mess with too much of this social media stuff because it just poisons your brain. That's why I see it. What you care about what somebody else doing? Just stay on your thing and represent yourself as the best human being that you can be. And people will recognize your leadership. They will recognize your strength, and you won't you won't have a bunch of slime balls coming in your direction because they already gonna know. I, I got no play there. But you might network more positive people in your life, and you'll be better off for it. Trust me. OK. And Ashley says, thank you so much. Uh, you are so brave to tell us your story. And she had to, she has to go. She had to leave. So she has to go to attend to another class. Oh. OK. Um, and that's it. I don't know. Anybody else have any questions? Or uh, they'd like to ask Mr. Brown? Wrap it up here. Okay. Well, actually, guys, why don't we do this? Well, let's. Well, where am I? I'm on here. Okay, let's let's wrap it up here, guys. Um, thank you so much, guys, for uh, attending, and I hope you guys appreciated Sean here. Before I leave, guys, right? If you guys could please, on the comments, just throw a little shout out to Sean, right, guys? Maybe a thank you about what, what you guys just saw. This is like therapy for him. It really is. It makes him feel. The whole, you know, exactly. you know, so if you guys have some insight you want to give them about what, whatever it is, guys, all right. And then when that guy, see you guys later, have a good day. Uh, I'll, I'll keep you guys in touch about the assignment, right? Just write that up. And that's our last assignment for the whole year, guys. All right. So on your way out, guys, see you guys later and catch you, catch you soon, guys. Stay safe, everyone. Cody, I sound camera. Don't, don't hang up yet. Oh, shoot. Because they're still saying goodbye. So just the camera, the sound. Okay.